in terms of why we're doing that, um, it really comes down to um, some developments that have happened in the last couple of years in terms of trying to raise standards across the kitchen extract duct work cleaning industry in, in real terms. And I think that's what's, uh, that's what's particularly prompted this, uh, this webinar and, um, and, and the reason we're doing it uh, about now. But I'll come on to that um, a little bit later on. I think we're probably all aware of the, the common causes of, of, of fires in catering extract uh, or in, in, in catering environments, I suppose. Um, tried looking back to find some useful research on this and, and, and I came across one or two papers uh, from a young lady that I was introduced to quite recently um, who'd done her PhD into, um, into this particular into this particular issue and, and, and looking at examples of uh, or ways of, of minimising risk, particularly in the cleaning process. Um, but if you go back far enough, I found research from BRE in 2005 that um, they did a survey of London Fire Brigade um, fires and found that they'd had around 700 fires involving heat and exhaust ventilation systems um, over the course of just one year. Um, statistics weren't really uh, refined enough to, to give us any more detail than that. But in NFPA information indicates that they have around, um, well, they have um, a sufficient number of uh, fires each year in kitchen catering extract duct work um, that results in losses of, of uh, in excess of $100 million, um, again, and that's on, a, on an annual basis. So it's really quite a significant issue and something that we probably pay too little attention to. But in terms of the common causes of fire, well, I've put a few on the on the screen there. Human error, obviously, people doing things wrong, um, people not doing things right, uh, which can often be different things entirely. Poor standards of housekeeping, not just in terms of cleaning of ductwork, but in the environment generally, um, and ensuring that combustible the, the volumes of combustible materials are, are minimised and that they're kept clear of ignition sources. Just basic issues such as that. Failure of cooking equipment with thermostats not working effectively or overheat devices um, not properly functioning or tested or maintained. Failure of gas equipment, of course, um, albeit we're not necessarily going to focus on that. And then, of course, the extract ductwork equipment itself and in particular the, the, the standards of cleaning and, um, and in some instances its design, its layout um, and the, the type of equipment that's actually being used. There are, of course, other factors, poor standards and maintenance with, um, you know, or lacking maintenance entirely, which is, uh, is, is not uncommon. Um, we also have risks associated with um, unattended processes, so um, cooking being left unattended for periods of time while, um, while chefs and, and, uh, and, and those in the catering establishment deal with other issues. Um, we may have problems with equipment not being switched off when it's not in use, um, which can lead to accidents or, or incidents. Um, or uh, we mentioned overheating of oils where thermostats fail or where um, safety devices are, are bypassed. So there are numerous causes of, of fire and, um, and clearly we need to be in a position to look at how we can best minimise that. You know, we're going to talk specifically about the extract ductwork, but if you can stop the fire getting into the ductwork in the first place, then you're clearly in a far better position. Um, why are we concerned about extract ductwork? Well, in real terms, we, we recognise that the um, the, the hood is often some distance above the cooking surface, but as the photograph on the on the slide shows um, at the moment, um, it's not uncommon for flames to spread quite some height um, from the uh, the flammable vapours that are given off through the cooking process and the oils and the greases that are used in the process. Uh, and uh, similarly, if you were you know you may be cooking burgers and. Uh, if, uh, if they all spit at the same time, you still may have a flame that reaches up um, beyond um, the, uh, the suppression system maybe and into the ductwork and the filters themselves. The filters are, are, are an issue from, from square one and something that we're going to, to touch on in a, in a few moments. Um, but as I've just described, um, often the fires aren't confined to the pan, hob or the surface um, with no development beyond. Um, they do spread, and in commercial environments, um, whether you've got an extract canopy and ductwork, um, it's not uncommon for the flames to impinge on the underside of the um, on the underside of the ductwork, um, the canopy hood, and the um, and the filters themselves. I think something we we might overlook in terms of uh, trying to um, impress upon owners and end users the need to ensure that 
kitchen fire safety is managed effectively and the extract ductwork is cleaned, um, is that the fact that they have a, a, a legal duty to do so. Um, and I've just put a few examples here. Um, the workplace health, safety and welfare regulations require ventilation systems to be cleaned appropriately. Um, there's a, a specific HSD document from the health and safety uh, executive called General Ventilation in the Workplace Guidance for Employers, um, which describes ventilation and fresh air requirements, um, which often these systems are, are designed to use, um, and also makes reference to the um, H. DCA, who are now the Building and Engineering Services Association and CIVC as being able to provide information and guidance on um, ductwork and uh, contaminants and cleaning. Um, and also states, you know, if you run your finger along the opening of a duct and it collects dust, then it probably needs cleaning, which is quite interesting. Beyond that, we've also got the regulatory reform fire safety order. And again, I think this is probably something that uh, is too commonly overlooked. Maybe because the um, vast majority of us, um, uh, and me included for quite some time, weren't entirely clear on what the responsible person actually meant. Now, of course, I'm dealing with a piece of legislation that's only applicable in, uh, in England and Wales, Scotland, Ireland and Northern Ireland all have their own legislation, but the requirements are all very, very similar. Um, and in general terms, there's a requirement there to make a suitable and sufficient assessment of the risks to which people are um, are focused and of course if they don't consider the the risks associated with the extract duct work and the potential for fire to spread into and beyond the duct work then the assessment could be deemed as not being suitable and sufficient I'm sure that's the way enforcing authorities would look at it but it also goes on to say that it's not just this responsible person or the employer that is held responsible for ensuring safety but that responsibility is is, is also devolved to lots of other people who may have in any way shape or form some um, uh, responsibility for safety on the premises. Um, now that may be safety in terms of supporting an evacuation, for example, or it may be safety in terms of maintaining fire detection and alarm system or a sprinkler system. But it might also be down to um, those responsible for ensuring the cleanliness of the kitchen or the effective cleanliness of a kitchen extract ductwork system. Um, so responsibility extends quite far and wide um, and I think it's important that we're able to draw attention to this when we're speaking to um, those who, uh, uh, who are looking for advice and guidance from us um, in that they fully understand that if they don't think, do things properly then they can be held to account for it and it's not just for the big things, it's also for things like the cleaning of extract duct work. Um, this really just summarises what I've just said in, in real terms. It's not, a, it's not a duty of care, it's not a voluntary obligation, it's now a legal one. Um, the only difficulty we really have in terms of this piece of legislation is the fact that uh, there's no decent definition of competence or competent. Um, the legislation says suitable or well, sufficient training and experience or knowledge and other qualities, but gives us very little information as to what the knowledge and other qualities may be. I'm sure some of you have heard me mooted the fact that, um, you know, grade eight piano or uh, or a cycling proficiency certificate are probably not going to cut the mustard but um, in some way shape or form I think that the reviews that are currently underway um, associated with the Grenfell Tower incident may hopefully tease out a bit more detail as to what competency might mean in terms of uh, management of fire safety. There's also the gas installation and use regulation, the gas safety installation and use regulations, which apply to gas appliances that are found in most catering premises. Um, some appliances you'll know will be known as a type B, um, and these require the flu to comply with the regulations. Um, type B equipment is likely to include some combination ovens and, and, and deep fat fryers. Um, and it indicates where extraction, i.e. under a canopy serves that purpose, is considered a flu, i.e. It's, it's exhausting gas away, or could be exhausting gas away, and requires appropriate an interlocking system connecting the airflow to the gas supply. Um, you don't see that in all catering establishments, certainly not in my experience. Um, however, um, where you do have those types of systems beneath a canopy, you should be expecting to see an interlock system which ensures that um, the ventilation system must be operating before the gas supply or gas can be supplied to the, the cooking equipment itself. So moving beyond the legislation and, and apologies for um, moving on so quickly but um, hopefully you all understand the reasons for it. Um, there may be other factors that increase fire risk in catering establishments 
for example, evidence that uh, the system is not used or is unreliable, and these are the sorts of visual checks that we need to make when we're inspecting systems. Obviously, poor design and maintenance of the system, and um, we'll be talking a little bit about what constitutes good design in a, in a, in a few moments. Um, so we may have long convoluted ducts, we may have broken fans, ductwork may leak, there may be visible escape of, of cooking fumes or, or steam for the process, for, for example. Lack of accessibility for cleaning is very common and one of the, the most significant causes why ductwork may not be effectively uh, uh, cleaned and, and may support combustion. Lack of user awareness of the effect of using gas appliances without adequate ventilation. Often that's not, um, that's not clearly established, which may create um, some form of uh, a flammable environment. Um, the extensive use of gas-fired appliances for long periods without a ventilation system, an aging system or installation where um, it's, it's, it's clearly not fit for, no longer fit for purpose. There may be a, a lack of routine or planned maintenance, um, which is something which uh, again would, would cause concern. But we also have to factor or looking at the, the types of cooking oils and, and fats that might be used or even the types of cooking. Um, for example, um, different styles of cooking will produce um, different types of, um, uh, of greases or, or deposits within the extract ductwork. Um, Thai cooking or Chinese food creates um, a, a syrup-like grease that um, can be very, very difficult to remove. Um, if you're cooking or charbroiling meat, for example, you get large quantities of grease which, um, which will easily bind to the, um, to the, 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 the surface of the, of the ductwork, um, which then makes it easier for additional layers to adhere, um, and you end up with a fairly unpleasant um, thick buildup. And of course, you may end up with some um, other deposits from you know, overcooked meats and, and such like in terms of, uh, of ash or grease from the process. Um, Deep, that deep fat frying produces a, a particular type of, um, of, uh, of almost um, see-through brown grease deposit. Um, and frozen foods, particularly if they've got large quantities of water in them and they're, they're, they're very well hydrated, um, will create a, a very different type of grease, which is a shiny, has a shiny hard um, look to it. So there are a number of issues which we which we we do need to consider in that respect, and and I think that uh, there are other factors associated with the types of oils used um, and the and the frequency of them being changed. Um, cooking oils, if they're repeatedly used, will over time um, oxidise, which reduces their flash point. So you may have a an oil which has a traditionally would have a flash point of between maybe 200 and 300 degrees, um, but over time the flash point will reduce quite significantly, um, which means it's more likely to, um, to combust, um, particularly if thermostatic controls aren't in place, or alternatively um, there's, uh, there, there are other sources of ignition nearby. This is a diagram that's taken from a publication that Risk Authority publish, um, RC44. Um, if you've not read it, um, I'm not quite sure what to say, but there's some good advice and guidance in there. My, my, my usual quip in, in terms of some of these documents is that if you're having trouble sleeping, they're a surefire cure for insomnia. Um, but they do contain huge amounts of, of very, very useful information. And, and this is just a, a diagram which describes some of the, the facets of, of a system. Um, maybe not in size or extent of some of the systems that we uh, we might commonly come across because we're talking about a you know a single hood above a, a cooker whereas often we're dealing with with far larger um, ranges with far larger canopies and hoods over them um, with extract plenums and, and, and such like. Um, but at least it gives us a, a good understanding of, of exactly what components go into to making the system up in terms of the the, the, the hood itself, um, the extract duct work um, and it could be argued in, 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 in certainly in terms of this diagram that the, the duct work doesn't necessarily take the, the shortest and most direct route to the, um, to the outlet which um, there, there may be opportunities for improvement there because the fewer turns you have in the, in the duct work the less likely it is to, uh, to catch grease and similarly we're showing um, a system here with, with, you know, with squared corners whereas you're going to get a far better flow of air um, and uh, movement of grease out of the system if you have um, uh, you don't have corners such as that in itself. <clears throat> but in terms of the, the ventilation systems, you don't always have um, simply a, uh, um, a a hood over the the cooking 
um, equipment, um, you may have a, an entirely ventilated ceiling. Um, these work in much the same way. They have intake and extract um, elements to uh, to them. Um, they draw um, the heated air out with the the grease particles mixed in, um, and they push cool air back in. And the grease is captured into the into the ceiling pods, which is a modular system, so you can remove the pods and, uh, and clean the grease that way. Um, manufacturers insist that they're designed to stop grease and fats falling back down into the kitchen environment, but uh, um, whether or not they're as hygienic as other types of system, I don't really know. But in terms of the hood itself and the, and the systems themselves, regardless of the type of extract that exists, they're really there for three functions. They're, they're there to pro provide a degree of fire protection in as much as they're there to remove grease from the, um, from the environment and, uh, and present it in a way that can be easily cleaned. They're also there to remove smoke and heat and vapour um, and to provide more appropriate working conditions for those who are who are based in the um, and based in that environment. So they're not it's not just about the fire safety element that they're there. They're, they're also there to serve other um, serve other purposes. Um, this particular diagram again comes from um, comes from RC44, uh, and uh, it just shows in more detail the. Um, the layout of the system beyond the beyond the hood, and on the left-hand side you can see the arrow directing cooking fumes up through a grease filter into a plenum, and then the air being extracted via a duct. and And it's these areas that uh, are of particular concern when it comes to uh, comes to cleaning. You see, there's also a, a, a grease collection channel which allows for grease to be um, moved away if it's captured in the filter and, and, and runs down into, into the tray. On the right hand side you can see a, a typical detail of a, of a wall and a roof um, with penetrations for a uh, the kitchen extract system. Um, again it sh simply shows the hood or canopy with the extract ductwork passing through the roof, the need for a fire rated continuous enclosure to prevent um, a very hot duct or a fire in a duct um, should, it, uh, should it occur. Uh, conducting heat to surrounding materials and, and spreading the fire further. Uh, and other important aspects such as uh, the fan which is set outside of the, the ductwork itself um, in order to, uh, to draw the air through, albeit that it will still become contaminated very often. Um, the access doors that are there for cleaning and the, the discharge point itself. So in terms of, of design, where do we go? Well, the HVCA, or now as they call themselves, the Building and Engineering Services Association, produce um, this particular document, DW172, uh, which is a specification for kitchen ventilation systems and provides um, some excellent guidance in there as to how systems should be effectively designed to ensure that they, uh, they fulfill their function um, in providing a degree of fire protection, um, exhausting air and providing adequate working conditions, but uh, um, with a particular focus in, in this instance on the, on the kitchen systems that we're, that we're dealing with. Um, this document is called upon in, in other guidance in, in lots of other locations, including our own um, RC44 document, so it's, it's very much seen as an industry bible. Uh, despite the fact there's design guidance for systems, doesn't always mean that systems will be designed and installed um, to the standard. I think that uh, where systems are being designed into a new build or a significant refurbishment, it may be far simpler to design um, in accordance with the standard than it would be if you're retrofitting into an existing space where uh, you may not necessarily be able to meet all of those design requirements. So despite the fact um, you may be told that the system was designed and installed in accordance with the uh, um, in accordance with the specification um, in much the same way as we might ask on inspecting a premises to see the completion certificate for um, a fire detection and alarm system which will list any deviations from the standard, it may also be worth asking a very, very similar question in terms of design criteria, uh, just so it's easier to understand exactly how the, um, the documents, or how the, the system's been, uh, been designed, whether there are any significant anomalies from the, the design criteria. In terms of, of guidance, external guidance on cleaning and cleanliness, again, the Building and Engineering Services Association produce um, what is seen to 
all intents and purposes as an industry Bible. Um, it was first published in 1998, although they had earlier guidance which, which touched on extract duct work um, But their current version is, uh, is now TR19 and that was published in 2014. Um, the risk control working group of risk authority were given the opportunity to, to comment on it and I think we were able to uh, to influence the document um, quite nicely to to include some um, some important points and uh, it's interesting that this document actually calls up RC44 in itself um, we haven't always had the um, the smoothest of relationships with uh, B and ESA, but um, it's good to see that there's a degree of compatibility between what we are advising um, and, uh, and what they're advising in their own guidance documents. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen the exciting front cover of uh, RC44, there it is in all its glory. Um, as you can see, it was produced some time ago now and the, the Risk Control Working Group have spoken about the need to update it, certainly in light of the um, update to TI-19, but also in light of uh, other works that have gone on since, which um, which I'll come on to towards the end of the uh, of the presentation. Um, the the document was really designed to support the fire risk assessor or the insurance surveyor in in looking at systems and 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 uh, being able to make a, a judgment as to whether um, it was good, bad, or indifferent, or uh, certainly was in a position that needed some remedial treatment. Um, and I've just put an example, some example text there, which just shows you how the the document flows. So in in, in addition to the guidance that's provided, there are also a series of checklists which um, uh, which you can use. Uh, which enable you to understand whether the system you're looking at represents low risk, a normal risk, or a, or a high risk in very, very simple and crude terms. But uh, there's no other guidance like it, and um, and I think it's very, very useful in the way that um, it's it's laid out itself. So you can see there. So if there's boiling with no risks or oil or grease vapor, that's low risk. Conventional frying or processes emitting steady vapor flow can be classed as a normal risk. But if you've got open flame grilling, flame cooking, and sudden emissions of hot vapor, then clearly you're going to see that as a higher risk um, uh, activity. I think we're all familiar with these sorts of situations, although maybe not quite as extreme where um, oil and grease uh, filters haven't been cleaned and uh, grease is leaking from the from the system and rather than cleaning it effectively, they decided to uh, to take a slightly different approach, which is just to stuff it with tissue and hope that absorbs it. Um, but very often results in these kinds of scenarios with uh, significant loss to the premises. As you can see there, the kitchen itself is very, very badly damaged, but the damage beyond that into the extract ductwork and the areas that the ductwork passes through is likely to be just as bad. So starting with the system and just looking at some of the some of the bits, I suppose, and the, the elements that make up the system, um, starting with the kitchen canopy. Now, very often the responsibility for cleaning the canopy um, falls to the, um, the 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 operator of the the kitchen themselves not something that's necessarily going to be cleaned by an external contractor who's coming in to, to look at the duct work although they may pick it up as part of their routine cleaning operations um, and it's quite common to visit a catering establishment and see a very very clean um, uh, canopy and hood and um, you know remark to yourself that uh, oh this is uh, this is in is, this is in fine nick I've probably very little to worry about um, however what you can't necessarily see certainly on this sort of visual inspection is is just how clean the the system is behind the uh, behind the filters themselves um, as I mentioned earlier, the HSG202 says, as a general rule, if you run your finger along the opening of a duct and it collects dust or grease in this instance, then it probably needs cleaning. Um, it's, a, it's as straightforward as that. And we could draw correlations to you know, depths of, of dust and dirt in terms of uh, minimizing dust explosions in dusty environments, but uh, grease responds fairly differently um, and, uh, and doesn't, uh, doesn't necessarily fall into a similar category, but we'll talk about how that's measured itself. Um, as you can see there, uh, a system with uh, extract hood with a series of filters associated with it. And just wanted to touch on some of the different types. Um, this is a diagram, again, that's taken out of RC44. The way I've mentioned that document, anyone would think I get commission from it, but, but sadly we don't. Um, 
There are a number of different types of filters, uh, mesh type filters, baffle filters, um, an example of a cartridge and a water wash filter and, and certainly in terms of the order in which I've described them, they go from um, the, the, the most risk from a fire perspective to, to, the, to, to the least risk from a fire perspective. Um, the mesh types are a, a metal frame, steel frame um, with a series of, uh, of layers of, of mesh inside and they're simply there to collect the majority of oil and grease as it passes from the cooking um, uh, surface through and always drawn through into the um, into the extract duct work. Um, the issues associated with that are that they do collect a huge amount of, uh, of oil and grease and they do need very very regular cleaning as a result of it um, and the fact that they collect so much grease in the way that they do does mean that um, the likelihood of ignition um, and, and a serious blaze is, is quite high with, uh, with, these types of, um, with these types of filters. Um, we can also have baffle type filters and I apologize, I'm not sure the photo is particularly clear, but um, baffle type filters have a series of interlocking veins in them um, which creates um, uh, changes in direction of the airflow um, which traps the, um, traps the grease and, and the grease then uh, um, is released to run down into a, uh, into a collection tray. Or a collection drawer where it can be where it can be cleaned from, um, and because of the way the, the the grease is almost extracted from the airflow and isn't held within a mesh uh, and can be and can be taken away, it reduces the the potential for ignition at that particular point. Um, that's just a clean shiny one up close. Um, the other types of uh, the other types that I mentioned were the cartridge type. Um, again, they have a, they're very similar to the to the baffle types. They have slot openings and uh, a series of baffles again, which create um, a uh, changes in the airflow, captures the the grease from the air, um, which again is deposited into a tray, which can be subsequently subsequently um, subsequently cleaned away. And then the the last time was the last type was the water wash type um, filter. Uh, where the interior of the uh, of the filter area is um, and the uh, the um, plenum is uh, cleaned by a, a water spray. Either um, hot and cold water can be used, um, often with a, a dosed level of detergent, um, which helps to um, reduce the volume of grease and oils that's being extracted further into the into the system. Um, some of the systems will continually spray cold water um, that helps to sort of change the composition of the of, of the of the um, of the grease within the airflow itself and again in that way um, reduces the potential for significant volumes of grease to be to de be deposited into the uh, into the extract duct work further beyond um, particularly good for solid fuel appliances um, where the potential for hot ember exists but certainly in terms of filter cleaning, I made reference to DW172 earlier and uh, it's interesting that it states there primary filters that retain grease within the filtration matrix until clean shall not be used. Um, so certainly an encouragement to move away from the use of the mesh type filters themselves because of the potential for significant build-ups. Um, there is a, a loss prevention standard produced by um, BRE certification or, or LPCB um, which describes the death test to determine both the grease removal efficiency and the flame resistance of grease filters LPS 1263 and clearly using those types of filters is going to present a uh, a far safer environment. Um, again, referring back to RC44, there's a little table in there which just summarises what we were discussing, um, the fact that uh, different types of filter present different types of risk, mesh being the highest and the, the water wash or the cold water mist um, being the, the lower risk, at the lower risk end. Um, in terms of certification, I've mentioned LPS um, 1263, uh, grandly titled requirements for the LPC B approval and listing of five performance of grease filters used in commercial kitchen extract systems. Um, but again, it, it moves, moves slightly beyond that, but certainly gives us an opportunity to ensure that when we're inspecting systems or whether we're um, involved in some way in the design and specification of systems that we can, uh, we can be recommending suitable types of filters. Um, the uh, TR19 indicates um, requirements in terms of when does a system need cleaning? I've just shown a, a couple of devices, um, uh, one quite techy and, and, and one quite manual, um, which are used to measure 
um, wet film thicknesses. Uh, but in, in general terms, um, 200 microns measured as a mean across the system would indicate the complete cleaning is required of the entire system and any single measurement above uh, 500 microns would suggest that urgent local cleaning um, is, is going to be necessary. These are very much rules of thumb and uh, if you're working with a system or an organisation with systems that um, are monitoring um, the deposits on a, on a regular basis then um, it's certainly uh, something that can be applied. However, you'd like to think that uh, in real terms that over time a risk assessed approach to the frequency of internal cleaning has come up with a frequency that uh, as, is ensuring that those levels aren't met at any point and that cleaning is undertaken um, before those, um, those particular um, levels of, or depths of, uh, of grease are, are actually achieved. Um, just a couple of examples there of where you probably don't need a gauge that measures in microns to determine the fact that uh, the system is filthy and, uh, and needs effective cleaning. Uh, certainly if you're coming across something of that nature, um, then an immediate clean and, and, and a halting of, of any form of cooking processes would probably be necessary in order to ensure the safety of the premises. Um, I'm not entirely sure how fire and rescue services or enforcing authorities would deal with a situation like this, but uh, I could imagine that they wouldn't look upon it too kindly and may issue prohibition notices as a result. And that's a, a photograph that I'm sure some of you have seen before. Um, uh, it's just a, a nasty lump of grease removed from just 15 metres of, of an extract ductwork. Um, 2.8 kilograms um, per metre of, of ductwork were extracted um, to, to form that level of grease. And of course, there is a significant fire load um, maintaining that. So typical cleaning frequencies, this is what we're often is often proposed or is often put forward for primary filters in accessible parts of the canopy. They should be done weekly, ductwork every six months. Um, a rule of thumb but doesn't necessarily fit the bill in the vast majority of circumstances. Um, frequency should definitely be based upon um, the frequency of use and the duration of use and looking at uh, TR19 it provides us with this particular guidance um, in terms of the levels of grease production which they classify as low, medium and high, gives some typical examples and then um, relate that to the daily usage um, in terms of hours of, of each system and then propose cleaning intervals in terms of months. Um, as you can see there, it varies quite widely, but where you've got a system that is used between 12 and 16 hours a day, for example, um, where there's heavy, significant or continual production of grease-laden aerosols during normal operations, then you should be looking at cleaning, a full clean of the, uh, of the extract systems every three months. Um, rather than um, at, a, at, a, at a lesser frequency. But again, these are, um, these are guidelines really um, and that anybody managing their systems effectively will know um, exactly how often they need to clean the systems based on um, the, uh, the cleaning activities that have been undertaken previously and the levels of grease that have been identified on each of those occasions. Um, RC44 provides a bit more di uh, a bit more detailed guidance. Um, it says the frequency of local inspections behind filters depends on the cooking process and hours of operation, but should be at least weekly. So that's just for any visual inspection. Um, metal surfaces should be checked for accumulated grease or dirt. Um, it also advises that it's ineffective to create fire breaks by cleaning small areas around um, access panels in order that potentially the fire won't spread from one space to another, but anybody who is familiar with the dynamics of fire uh, will understand very, very quickly that it's not necessarily um, the fact that a material is impacted by a flame um, that causes it to ignite. Um, every material has an auto ignition temperature um, and greases and fats are no different and in general terms will have quite low auto ignition temperatures compared to other types of material. And so that sort of approach to cleaning is, is, is going to be completely ineffective. Um, insides of all filter house, housing and grease collection trays should be cleaned weekly as a, as a minimum. Um, where removable filters are fitted, they should only be removed when the system has been shut down to prevent unfiltered air entering the ducts. You may clean them by putting them in a dishwasher 
sure they can be uh, hand washed to remove the grease. Um, but it goes on to say, which is different to the guidance we've seen earlier, cartridge filters having integral grease collection reservoirs should be cleaned at least twice a week, and the extract plenum behind filters being part of the design and grease collection in this area should be removed by regular cleaning again at least twice a week. So the, 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 the our own insurer focus guidance um, uh, recommends uh, slightly increased frequencies in certain locations, but I think I can't express enough that we should really be considering this in terms of a risk assessed base uh, on a risk assessed approach rather than um, simply just basing it on, on on figures such as this. Problematic areas for cleaning include um, turns in the uh, turns in the ductwork. You can see an example on the left hand side of a 45 degree or a right angle turn in the ductwork um, where turning vanes have been um, have been installed to help the airflow to move, but all that does is increase the volume of grease and oils that are collected. Or similarly on a centrifugal fan where um, in, in this circumstance, um, oils and grease have been allowed to accumulate quite significantly. So when it comes down to design, um, it's important to ensure we try to minimize certainly um, the 45 degree or, or, or even the 90 degree bends in the, in the systems, sh shallower bends um, or alternatively having radial bends um, are a far better approach. Um, in circumstances such as this, you're clearly going to need to ensure that both the vanes, um, the fans, the blades of the fans are, are, can all be cleaned effectively every time the, uh, the internal cleanliness of, the, um, uh, of the, the system is being checked and is being cleaned. Partial cleaning is a problem and, and happens quite commonly. A couple of examples there where um, top the left hand side, partial cleaning for no good reason in real terms. Um, on the right hand side, you can see that one side of the, the duct has been cleaned, the other side hasn't. Um, maybe more due to the fact that it's easier to reach certain places than others or um, alternatively that the, the contractor is just not doing a proper job. In order to ensure that cleaning can be done effectively, um, you'll find this guidance in a number of locations. Uh, this is taken from um, the, uh, the BNES publication TR19, which I mentioned earlier, which just describes the location of access panels for cleaning and inspection purposes, um, highlights the, the various areas of concern, and, um, and, and, and describes exactly um, where the, uh, the access panels should be. Um, you'll notice there where it talks about horizontal ducts generally at three meter sections um, and in risers again maximum of three meter centers to ensure that all areas of the of the ductwork can be um, can be effectively cleaned. We need to ensure also that the that the access panels are, are adequate in size, not just in location, to enable the system to be clean. There's a, an example there where the, the panel is far too small um, to enable somebody to clean that length of, of ductwork effectively, particularly if it's being done by hand. And again, from TR19, that's of openings. These are only recommendations; they're not hard and fast rules, but they do provide a degree of uh, of, of, of direction in terms of um, of what we should be looking for when inspecting systems, um, ensuring that the the access panels are suitably sized for the uh, the type and size of, of ductwork in use. Um, the the top table deals with re rectangular and, and flat oval um, ductwork. The the lower table deals with circular ductwork, um, but in real terms it's, it's simply about the, the size of the, of the opening. An uh, example there of how not to hang yourself out of, off the top of a building in order to cut new access panels into, uh, into extract ductwork, but that isn't uncommon. Um, when systems are identified where cleaning can't be done effectively due to um, the lack of access panels, um, sadly we're no longer to allowed to, to, to drop small children into the, uh, into the extract ductwork to clean, um, although some people do have to clamber in there from time to time. The, the, the idea being that we, we cut access panels and allow them to, to clean from there. But it's, uh, in, in circumstances like that, it's clearly important that the panels are, are, are cut where they need to be and that can, cleaning can be done effectively. Um, it's also important that the, um, uh, that the panels cut into the sides um, of the ductwork and not into the bottom. Um, the panel cut into the bottom is clearly just going to become clogged with, with, with oils and grease and making it difficult to, to use or maybe even sealing it shut and, um, and restricting access. Um, and you can see there on the right hand side a, a far better example of where panels have been cut at regular frequencies or regular intervals to enable um, 
to enable cleaning. Uh, of course, kitchen extract systems have got to be kept um, separate to other types of extract systems because of the risks associated with them. Um, and the intention is, um, certainly from a design perspective, that they take the shortest route um, to the outside and that they minimise um, the number of bends, again, because the, the bends are where the oil and grease is most likely to um, is most likely to build to, to build up. In this situation, you can see there's a relatively long section of ductwork external to the premises, and that's something we also try to avoid, simply because when the ductwork gets cold, that increases the rate at which oil and grease will build up because it won't be extracted from the system as effectively. Um, it's not uncommon in those circumstances to to actually insulate the ductwork um, to enable the, uh, the, the 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 system to work effectively. And of course, where um, because we've got grease and oils and dust uh, uh, being passed through the duct, um, there should be no fire dampers in the in the system itself. There are several, several different cleaning methodologies. Again, you'll find this, this particular table in, in, a, in a number of different guidance documents, including our own and, uh, and uh, TR19. Um, it's difficult to suggest whether some are better than others. Uh, at the end of the day, it's important that the system gets cleaned effectively, regardless of the approach that's taken, and hand cleaning or hand wiping and hand scraping can be just as effective as some of the other um, cleaning mechanism or cleaning methods um, if it's done competently. Um, different types of, of, of cooking, as I mentioned earlier, will create different, different types of grease and, and fat deposits and, and some of these systems might be, uh, some of these cleaning methodologies might be more suitable for the different types of oils and fats that exist. Um, in other guidance, the, the design guidance we mentioned earlier um, talks about ensuring that the ductwork is maintained a sensible distance from combustible materials. And I'm sure we've all seen examples of where this isn't the case. Um, there is guidance in approved documents to the building regulations, approved document J, I think it is, and within approved document B, it talks about um, service penetrations through combustible um, construction elements. Um, but DW172 simply states a figure a minimum separation distance of 500 millimetres. The reason being, if you've got a, a fire within the flue itself, um, then the, uh, the ductwork is going to get extremely hot um, and may be hot enough to cause ignition of, uh, of materials located adjacent. Um, as I mentioned, things have moved on a little bit um, over time. Um, a few years ago, uh, the Risk Control Working Group um, was made aware of some, some industry uh, research that had been undertaken, not necessarily by insurers directly, but, but, but by a large um, property owner. Um, and the results of that, uh, the results of that research um, highlighted a number of concerns that um, improperly maintained duct work was seen to be uh, often a result of a poor work ethic of contractors um, engaged to undertake the cleaning work. And this could take the form of fraudulent activity, contractors to just don't do the work, or alternatively, um, don't do the work fully or properly, who provide no evidence that the, um, that the, the system has been effectively cleaned, um, use inefficient or ineffective equipment and cleaning um, methods, um, or ignore areas that are slightly more difficult to reach. Uh, um, this is not hearsay. This is not. Um, this is not something that's uh, you know um, been imagined. This is as a result of, um, of of research that's been undertaken and clearly quite shocking. Um, bearing in mind that um, the the trade association at the time H. VCA or B and E S A at the time um, had a certification scheme of sorts, um, but clearly it was uh, it was suggested that that um, that that certification scheme maybe wasn't as fit for purpose as it should have been. The response to that was an approach to um, loss prevention certification board to develop a um, uh, to develop a certification standard for contractors involved in cleaning and maintenance of ductwork systems. Um, it was a, a slightly bumpy road. Um, it was well received initially and a small, uh, a small group to work on the document um, brought together. Uh, LPCB did their, their, their own research and sent people out to, to look at clean activities in the wild and, and were convinced um, that there was um, sufficient 
interest in such a scheme for it to be appropriate and clearly had a huge backing from um, from insurers. Uh, at some stage in the process, they they sadly decided to change the the focus from kitchen extract duct work to extract duct work in general, which meant that. Uh, uh, we had to go back, um, and uh, many thanks to to Alistair, Alistair Smith in particular from Aviva, who, um, who with myself um, bore the brunt of this work with support from the the rest of the the working group. But um, we had to go back and make representations to the LPCB and say that this wasn't going to be acceptable. Um, the outcome was production of an appendix, um, a specific appendix uh, within the, the the standard that deals with kitchen extract duct work. In its, itself, um, two particular sections to draw your attention to. One that deals specifically with the, the, with the cleaning process, and you can see there the criteria. Initial inspection requires a, a survey of the level of grease, including photographic evidence to be taken, a review of the status of the film uh, filters, details of the existing cleaning regime. Um, details of typical usage levels, identification of suppression systems and the maintenance, restricted access areas, and then some proposals to address restricted access issues to improve future cleaning. And the post-clean report, um, quite importantly, to include survey of the clean duct work, um, which includes photographic evidence, um, describes the status of the cleaned filters, includes a detailed schematic of the ductwork system showing areas of restricted access, makes recommendations for how to remedy problematic areas in terms of access, and details of any agreed ongoing cleaning and maintenance regimes. Um, and it's, it's pleasing to note that the, um, the, uh, the scheme has been very, very popular, and uh, a number of companies have, um, have flown at the chance to, uh, to get themselves approved under this scheme. Um, it just comes down to us now, really, to, to continue to, to, to promote it. Um, the standard also goes on to say it needs to be possible at the site to readily identify that the ductwork system has been the subject of activities covered by this standard and requires a label to be affixed in a location where it can be clearly visible and doesn't compromise the fire performance of the ductwork system. So not only is it should we know that it's being cleaned effectively, not only should there be a report that proves that and describes any any problems that there may have been in the cleaning process, but there should also be a label there that uh, enables us to, to quickly identify the fact that the, the system has been cleaned. Before wrapping up, and I know I've spoken for far too long, so apologies, um, suppression systems are, are clearly an important factor in, in in ensuring and and maybe minimising the, the potential for fire to spread up into the into the ductwork, but I think as 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 we discussed earlier and we've shown from some of the photographs, it's not uncommon for um, fire to be able to spread and bypass whatever um, triggering mechanism there is for the um, for the suppression system directly into the the filters, the extract, and uh, and up into the the ductwork itself if cleaning hasn't been affected uh, hasn't been effective. Um, there are also um, issues in terms of the suitability of the system and the siting of the system. It's just an example there of a, of a, of a kitchen that I was looking at um, recently with a deep fat fryer that is cunningly placed um, perfectly between two nozzles. Um, no guarantee whether either of them will actually do the job in terms of suppressing a fire that may have occurred um, in the in the deep fat fryer. But uh, sadly, with some of these systems, particularly um, electrical powered devices um, or, or others that aren't necessarily tethered, um, they can be moved um, around the kitchen and doesn't always mean that the suppression system will remain valid for the, um, um, for the layout that, uh, that remains. Um, one of the positive points to note is that uh, BAFE are in the process of developing a scheme for such suppression systems that will consider all facets. Um, taking right through from the design of the system through um, its its maintenance, its servicing, its cleanliness, and, and, and all of those elements. So um, in the not too distant future, we're hoping that there will be a scheme in place that uh, enables us to have a degree of more assurance that the, that the suppression systems that are in place are, are appropriate. Um, Suitability of systems, um, you'll find a little bit of guidance on this in, in, uh, in RC44. Um, which suggests that dry powder systems are more suitable for use on shallow frying or grilling equipment, carbon dioxide um, in, in certain circumstances, and that special specialist water mist systems are available, um, but that uh, 
um, you shouldn't necessarily use a water-based system where you've got cooking oils and fires because they can just make the, 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 the situation work. And it recommends, in general terms, that liquid chemical agent fire suppression systems and portable fire uh, extinguishers, in particular the, the class oil, the class F for oils, are preferable since they give greater level of cooling, um, and they will seal the, the surface of the oil. Or they, they will, um, the class F extinguishers use a saponification approach um, to basically turn the um, the oils into a soapy-like substance, which can no longer burn, um, which also helps to prevent reignition. Emerging solutions, which I just thought I'd touch on before I shut up. Um, We've had a presentation from, from this organisation. They produce a, a product called Vent, um, which uses a biological agent, which is sprayed um, at regular frequency um, into the extract ductwork, which is understand to break down the grease and oils that may be deposited inside into glycerin and fatty acids. Um, it then suggests that the waste products were either removed from the air handling unit itself or flow into collection channels. Now, the presentation that we saw um, uh, and the, the individual involved in the presentation wasn't really clear, clear on, on how this, um, um, this residue was, was taken away. Um, and at the moment, um, we've taken discussions with them no further. Clearly, we need to keep um, RC44 up to date and we'll be, it will be going through a review process, um, as I mentioned earlier, and we'd need to um, comment on these kinds of systems as, as a result of that. But at the moment, um, we've said no more to them. Uh, I was also introduced to a, uh, a young lady who'd done her PhD on this subject um, and was working with an organization which was using a similar um, um, a similar approach uh, using a biological cleaning agent which was sprayed at regular frequency again into the extract duct work. Uh, however, um, this produced a, a, a small or a, a limited quantity um, biomass residue. And the photographs I've seen of, the, uh, of, of what remains um, looks like a, a layer of dust and dirt on, on, the base of the, uh, on the base of the ductwork. Still likely to require some cleaning, but certainly an awful lot safer than, um, uh, an awful lot safer than um, the oils and greases that we traditionally be concerned about. Um, having discussed this with them, uh, we have said that we would meet with them again and, and talk in a bit more detail about um, how the system works and, uh, and, and what approach they may be prepared to take um, to us undertaking some form of, te uh, of testing to it. Um, you'll see the little note at the bottom that I list in. The, the product's called Xmist, and it said it re significantly reduces any fire risk associated with fatty deposits, offering the potential for considerable reductions in insurance premiums. So brace yourself for that. Um, there are also recirculating systems, and I really promise I'm definitely, most definitely coming to the end of the presentation now. Um, and these recirculation systems work um, by not necessarily having an extract, um, so limited volumes of um, limited volumes of, uh, of ductwork associated with it, where the air is contained within a system and continually fed um, from the extract side back into into the kitchen itself. Um, the, the systems use a, a series of additional filters, so they've got the initial um, capture of, of grease and oils, but then there's a, 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 an additional filtration unit that stands alongside the system that continues to, uh, through a, a series of, of, of additional um, filters to capture oils and grease. Um, there's a carbon filter at the far end to reduce odours, and then that filtered air can be reintroduced into the kitchen to supply. Um, in terms of, uh, of, of just some caveats associated with these kinds of systems, and I'm not sure we have enough information on them yet, really, to form an, uh, to form a, uh, you know, an informed view, but um, these sorts of systems can't, can only be used over electrically powered cooking equipment, not over gas equipment, so that immediately limits their, their, their use. Um, they're unlikely to reduce air temperatures, and so therefore there may be a need to for additional cooling air to be introduced into the kitchen itself by a, a separate system. Um, and one of the systems I've looked at said that whilst they are designed 
to not require ductwork directly to atmosphere, it's seen as good practice to provide some background ventilation within the kitchen. Um, in my view, that is, they're suggesting that there should be a duct to the outside just in case. Um, and they're likely to be best suited for use over light to medium output cooking equipment, for example, induction cookers. So they're not ideal, wouldn't be perfect for every situation, but there might be certain circumstances where um, such a system could be appropriate, uh, particularly in environments where um, refurbishment works are undertaken or a, a room is being repurposed as a kitchen, there's an opportunity to use these sorts of systems in those circumstances. But again, they will need to be subject to um, effective cleaning and uh, um, an effective maintenance to ensure that they remain um, fit for purpose and don't add to the fire risk. You'll be pleased to know I'm going to shut up now and that's the end of the presentation. But um, I hope it's not been too much and I hope I've covered enough ground um, and maybe pointed you in the right direction. I think one of the things that I haven't been able to, to mention is that the Building and Engineering Services Association um, publish some additional um, simple two-pager type guidance. Um, it's quite light touch uh, and doesn't cover every aspect that we may have or may, may have concerns over, but certainly in terms of being able to provide end users with guidance. Um, there's some there's some useful documents there. They're, they're free to download from their from their website. Um, I have a couple of examples if any of you want me to to send them on to you. So thanks very much for listening. I hope you've all stayed awake. Um, and uh, I'll hand back to Dominic. I think. Brilliant. Thank you, Howard. Um, we've had quite a lot of questions. Um, you up for answering a few? Oh, we can give it a go. <laughs> um, this, is, this is more of a statement than a question from from Alan Beatty. Um, he states that too often we are submitted cleaning certificates stating the ductwork has been cleaned in accordance with TR19, but instead of taking a certificate for face value, you often find on the cleaning report that large elements of the ductwork are inaccessible. Mm -hmm. Yes, sadly that's um, that's really not uncommon. Um, I came across some some cleaning certificates. Uh, earlier this week or the back end of last week, I can't remember now, I'm having so much fun. Um, and the, uh, the the comment on there was uh, that the system has been cleaned as well as we could and, and that was that was their statement in terms of what had been cleaned. Um, the certificates that they produced or the post clean reports that they produced for the, the, the clean they'd done six months earlier were of a very similar nature in as much as there was some photographic evidence, sorry, fire alarm test. Um, there was some photographic evidence, um, but and, and they said that the cleaning had been undertaken in accordance with, with TR19, um, and they felt that being able to describe those areas that hadn't been cleaned within that report um, was, was more than adequate and there was no further action taken. I think that the, the LPS that uh, I described earlier um, takes the step beyond that that says if you identify areas that can't be cleaned, even in your post-clean inspection, then you should already be thinking about what you're going to do about it. Um, and that in your post-clean report, you should be identifying to the end user what needs to be done to ensure that cleaning next time or, or cleaning in between times can be done effectively. Um, so sometimes I think it's important to look beyond the, the initial statement as, uh, as you quite rightly say. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Andy Simpson asks, for public buildings such as schools, colleges, etc., where do local authorities stand on making suppression systems compulsory? As far as I'm, as far as I'm aware, they, they, they stand quite some distance away from it. Um, certainly in terms of most of the school premises that, uh, that we inspect, um, and I'd have to say that as an organisation we probably look more at the, the um, uh, the private schools than we do at the public schools, although we have done a lot of work in the north of the country um, on, on, uh, on, on public schools and I think I'd suggest that less than 5%, 10% of uh, catering establishments or catering kitchens within schools have any form of suppression. Standards of fire safety in general terms are found to be relatively quite good, certainly in terms of compartmentation, detection and alarm systems and such like, and, and, and the cleanliness of systems, but uh, there certainly seems to be no drive towards um, installing uh, suppression systems across the board. Okay, um, one more. We, we've had so many questions and apologies that we can't answer them all. Um, but Nisha Madeira asks, what length of time would you be looking at in respect of a business interruption risk, i.e. how easy is it to replace an extract, extraction system? Sorry. 
Uh, I think that's very, very difficult to, to answer, but it's going to depend entirely upon the nature of the system, the extent of the system, and the, the premises that it's installed in. Um, I think if you were dealing with a standalone catering establishment, such as a fast food restaurant, you know, roadside type um, place, uh, often the standard of construction and standard of fire resistance in general terms of those sorts of environments or those types of premises is, is quite weak um, and the potential for a fire within the ductwork to spread beyond and do a significant amount of damage probably quite high um, in which case you're looking at the total loss of a of a you know of a very small premises and, and, a, and a fairly significant business interruption loss. However, um, there may be other circumstances where you're dealing with a um, a reinforced concrete premises um, with a kitchen on the ground floor, extract ductwork leading immediately to outside of the premises with very little reparation works in the event that there is a fire and very little potential for the fire to spread. In which case, um, you know the the interruption. Uh, costs could be quite low um, simply because it would be easy to replace a, the very short um, the very short run of duct work and the the system supporting it. I'm sorry it's not a straightforward answer um, because it, there are just too many variables in there I think really for us to be able to make a, an objective uh, assessment. Okay, thank you very much, Howard. Um, what I'll do is collate all those questions and perhaps separately, Howard might take a moment to um, to answer them all, but we've had over 20 questions and we've been online for over an hour and um, we've only booked the WebEx time for, for an hour. So I think we need to wrap <laughs> it up. Um, thank you ever so much for, for listening in. This has been one of our most popular webinars we've ever done. Um, so if you could leave some very nice feedback Especially about how I'd like, I'd like to think it was me. Yeah, absolutely <laughs> like to think it was me, but I'm sure it probably isn't. So. No. But if you can leave some nice feedback about Howard, so he's up for doing one again <laughs> in the near future, because he's. Uh, he's <laughs> but no, you have not enjoyed it. <laughs> but anyway, thank you ever so much for joining in, and we hope you have a very nice weekend. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Bye bye. All right, too much.